All right. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad you're here. We hope you had an incredible Thanksgiving. I want to give you a few announcements today. Uh, one, I know we're in the holiday season, but to remember um, to give to the, the ministry if the Lord is laying on your heart to do that. Um, and we've, we've given several different ways you can do that by phone, by text, or here in person. I think that'll be up there here in just a moment. So um, just be praying about what the Lord is laying on your heart to, to do with that, and then we encourage you to do so. Uh, we want to tell you about a garage sale that we're going to have planned on December the 12th at 7 a.m. until whenever it's done. And we would ask that you'd be willing to bring some things. Um, this is not a, uh, a garage sale like we've done in the past where you bring your stuff and you're selling your stuff and, and those kind of things. This is an outreach event to our community. And so you're going to be bringing things. Now, I'm also going to say, if you're going to donate items, please don't donate things that you yourself would not buy. So do not donate your underwear. <laughs> don't donate. You, you know what I'm talking about, the stuff that you see. All right. So donate things that, that would be good for an outreach event for right here and so we can reach our community um, and, and so into uh, the folks right here around our church. So that is December the 12th at 7 a.m. We also have the North Texas Food Bank that is coming on December the 11th, so the day before, and they will be at Veterans Park, but you do have to register online for it. So if, if that is something that uh, you could be in assistance of, or you know someone who can, then see Matt, and then y'all can, uh, he'll help get you registered and set up for that, or at least give you the information for it. Um, we will be decorating uh, for Christmas following the service today, and, and so if you'd be willing to stay and help with that, um, we would love to have any hands that could do it. The, you know, the more hands, the quicker it goes, and so if you could help, that'd be today after service. Um, we have been reading through um, some of the Psalms, this Thanksgiving scriptures, not Thanksgiving as in the day, but to understand what it means to have a spirit of thankfulness. And, and one of the ways to do that is we don't just get a thankful spirit just because. We get it by understanding the Word of God and, and spending time in the Word of God. So we want to hear what, um, what is said there. It says, I mean, if you'll read along with me. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Thank you again for being here. Thankful for you. And we're thankful for getting to see your faces week after week. And we invite you to worship with us uh, right now. Thank you. All right, everyone, let's just stand and sing this morning. Uh, so grateful to have you here. Uh, intimate group, but let's just sing out. Let's worship. Let's, uh, let's, let's chase after uh, the Lord this morning in song. Let's sing this out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, 
All other ground is sinking sand. Sing it out. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Singing out, church. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of all sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown and I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown that's the great news of the gospel is that it's, it's not dependent on us. It's, uh, it's dependent on the cross. It's dependent on the actions of Christ, not our actions. So you might be sitting here today and you might be thinking to yourself that you're not good enough. You might be thinking that uh, your actions disqualify you for some reason uh, to be in this house today. But the reality is the blood of Christ covers all that. Uh, the blood of Christ covers it all. So let's just sing about God's goodness. Die, her. A thousand stories of what they think you're like But I've heard the tender whispers of love In the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleased And that I'm never alone Sing it out, church you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 
It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways. To us, sing it. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, love so undeniable. I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love Love, 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 you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, just your voice to sing that out. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, Let's sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Sing Jesus, sing it out. In Jesus, the name above every other name. In Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing it out. In holy, there is no one like you. 
there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live to you and jesus the name above every other name and jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken lord god that is our prayer god that we will build our life upon you god that it's only that you we boast in, God. We don't boast in our own strength, our own power, God, because we fail every time. Uh, Lord, but you are faithful. You are, you are true. Your grace is sufficient. Your mercy is there for us every day. 
God, we just thank you uh, for our pastor as he brings a message today, God, that, uh, Lord, that uh, our lives will change today, God, in some way, God, that your word will pierce our hearts. It's on your name I pray. Amen. Man, keep singing, church. I don't care if it's through a mask or through a shield or from the house or whatever. Man, keep singing. Um, Worship was good. Thank you, brother. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Super excited about this one because it's a little bit out of the normal wheel box for me. Um... I hope you don't scare easy, and I'll tell you why, and then we'll let our kids go. Um, who in here Who in here does not do scary movies? Just doesn't do them. Doesn't do it. Really? Look at all those hands. Won't do a haunted house. Like, won't do anything. Okay, how many of you, like, scary stuff don't bother you if you know it's fake? But, like, when it's real, you're like, mm-mm. Or just scary stuff just in general? Oh, you bunch of sissies. I don't, I don't so much mind, you know, like, like the It movies, because I'm like, there's no clown from another galaxy that's going to come kill me. Like, clowns freak me out. Real clowns freak me out. That's just, what kind of grown person? Never mind. Anyway, you just ain't got no business putting on makeup and walking around messing with that. Just, no. Okay. But anyway, real clowns, see the difference? Clown from outer space that turns into a ball of light and kills kids? No, not so much. Real clowns? Scary. Uh, The reason I say that, we're going to talk today, Jesus is going to talk about an unclean spirit. We're going to talk some about demons and spirits and possession. Uh, Lily, last night we were sitting at the house and she goes, hey, what are you talking about? My default answer for the past, like, her entire life, when anybody asks me, when they go, so what are you preaching about Sunday? I'm like, Jesus. She goes, so we preaching about Sunday? And I turned, I looked at her, I said, demons. And she goes, really? She's been super excited about it. And so this morning we get here. Oh, yeah. It's a good thing about your daddy being a preacher. All the stories are about you. We get here and we're standing here and Jacob and Megan are, are, are practicing and everything. And she looks out this door and she goes, oh, there's Corey. And I said, ain't nobody outside that door. And she goes, yes, there is. It's Corey. And I was like, there's nobody outside that door. And she goes, I just saw him. And she runs over the door and she opens that door up and there's nobody there. And you see her come back in. She's like, it's a demon. And I, went, <laughs> and I went, logically, if it's not Corey, it must be a demon. So, uh, so I don't got one person freaked out. So we're going to find out how many people we can, we can really freak out today. But first, before we scare our babies, if you are a child ages three up through, well, let's say grade six, maybe some of our big kids can go back and help. Age three up through grade six, y'all can go back now. Jeffrey was perched like he thought about going. (laughs) Nate bringing up the rear. There he goes. For us grown folks, Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 43. Uh, We're going to skip a tree being known by its fruit. You know, if if you were with us last week, we talked some about... uh, Jesus being the Lord of the Sabbath, it really ties into the man with the withered hand. We'll come back to in this sermon, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because that's super important. A tree being known by its fruit, that's pretty obvious. Um, If you're not, not to be mean, I know a lot of preachers say that, you know, salvation is between you and the Lord, and, you know, I can't judge your heart. And they're absolutely right, I can't judge your heart. What I can do is judge your fruit. And if you're not producing good fruit, and good fruit does not necessarily mean you're, you're the Billy Graham of Venice. That, I'm not saying you have to be out there winning 75 people a day or you're not saved. What I mean by this is if you don't leave at least a pleasant aroma, if, if people can't look at you and see Christ in you, there's an issue. And you may want to really, really, really want to get that right with Jesus. Uh, the sign of Jonah, Jesus going into the earth for three days just as Jonah went into the belly because the people asked for a sign. We can go back. If you, if you want to study those things out, holler at me. Just say, hey, I want to understand that more and we'll get on them. But this one I thought 
really is the culmination of the chapter and really is the culmination of all of those things that Christ is talking about. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 in the ESV says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places. Some of your Bibles will say arid places, seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. And then it goes in and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and they dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. I want you to remember that sentence. So also it will be for this evil generation. While he was speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my, is my brother and my sister and my mother. Uh, there's a reason I want you to remember that. What Jesus says to that generation is kind of a, a, a drastic difference compared to what we're going to talk about today. Now, both are applicable, but one is directed right at the generation that he's talking to. So let's look at just a second. Verse 43, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none. What is... Let me ask you this question. Let's do a little systematic theology. What is... What are you made of? What are your, what? Adams. What, thank you, brother. Whatever that was. It was like my sinuses just cleared up. That was fantastic. Exercising demons out of that sound equipment. Uh, what, what are the, there are three parts to you. Anybody know what they are? Spirit, soul, body. Look at this guy. He could be a preacher. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, what is your body? It is this lovely sack of bones. It is this tent. It is the thing that we see that everybody knows you by, right? What is your soul? The decision-making part. It's what makes you, bless you, it's what makes you, you, ultimately. When the soul leaves, you're gone. The soul is an eternal you hear that? The body is temporal. Body's temporary. This thing's going to break down. The soul will not. The soul is eternal. Well, the soul is eternal. We can't say it won't break down. Hopefully yours don't break down because you'll be in heaven. But the soul is going to last forever. Now the spirit is something completely different. What is the spirit inside of you? Hmm? Okay, the part that's saved. Let me ask you this. Before you got saved, what was the spirit inside of you? Death. The spirit of man. Each one of us is born with each one of these three parts. You're born with a body, you're born with a soul, and you're born with a spirit. The spirit, by default, in us, is the spirit of humanness, this mankind spirit. And it is not pro-God. The spirit inside of you instinctively does not seek after the Lord's will. Only by the drawing of the Holy Spirit, only by the drawing of the Lord Himself, does your spirit ever begin to desire. Because you have to understand, when you come to Christ, when Christ says, He who comes to me must die, He's not talking about a bodily death, He's not talking about your soul dying. That's, that's the thing that I think is funny when people come into the office and they're like, you know, I would give my life to Jesus, but then i got to change everything about me. No, you don't. Everything about you is what makes you wonderful. All your little quirks and all your little idioms and all your little things, that's what makes you, you. Now, the part that does have to die is your human spirit, the part inside of you that strives for what's best for me. The part inside of me that says, I am the Lord over my life. That's the part that Jesus commands and says, it has to die. Because unless that part dies, the Holy Spirit won't indwell. Make sense? There can only be one person in the house at any given time. And if you're still in the house, Holy Spirit ain't there. 
You have to die. Not go on vacation and come back when it's convenient. I hear country songs, man, all the time. Country artists are the worst about it. I got a little Jesus, but I still like to cuss and I still like to drink and I still like, and you're going, well, then you don't have a little Jesus. You show up to church on Sunday because your girlfriend drug you in there. That's not salvation. Like it wears me out. That's not salvation. If you're still doing everything you desire to do and you're still desiring for you to be Lord over your life 99% of the time and then you show up to church and you go, I give Jesus this part. That's not being saved. That's being a whipped dog that was trained into going to church to make you feel better. When we come to Christ, we die. We're done. And the Holy Spirit takes control. We begin to seek after honoring God. Now, here's the thing. There is still a consistent and constant battle between the Holy Spirit directing you now to live your life to the glory of God and the soul who is still you, who still remembers all the fun we used to have and all the things we used to do, and the body that still has the repercussions and the longings for the things that we used to do. Look, inject heroin into your body. It might do something to the soul and the spirit, but what it's doing more is something to the body. There are neurological responses that get really jacked up when you inject things in there especially rat poison. It seems to have a really bad effect. And so even when you come to Christ, the body still longs for those things. Does that make sense? The spirit is now going, I can't do this. And that's where you get this war and this almost this just battle between us because the things that my body finds pleasurable and the things that my soul goes, hey, you remember when we used to do this? It really wasn't that bad of a time. And the spirit is now going, you have to stop that. That's why we always say guilt, good, honest, Holy Spirit-led guilt is a wonderful thing. When you sin and you feel bad about it, that's a phenomenal thing. That lets you know the Holy Spirit is working. Because if you don't feel bad, somebody's spirit's in there. It ain't God's spirit. There should be some honest, hard guilt. Three people in the house. There's only going to be three. There you go. The house either contains, A, if I think about my body as my house, the house is either going to contain, A, a wanted and wonderful guest. Right? Think about it. You just had Thanksgiving. Who was in your house? Who was in my, huh? Family. Did you want your family there? Ooh. <laughs> the honesty of the child. <laughs> Did you want your family there? Some of them. <laughs> Who's in my house at any given time? Right now, there better not be anybody in my house. Right? I didn't invite nobody over. If I invite you and you're welcomed into my house and we sit down and we have a meal, you are a welcomed guest. Or there's nobody. Or there is a thief in my house causing some sort of destruction. When we talk about the unclean spirits, and I want to break this all down because we have to understand who we are, what we are, who spirits are. All, we have to understand all of these things and how the spirit world interacts with our world. When we talk about this, guys, listen. A wanted and wonderful guest would be the Holy Spirit. He comes in. He keeps the house clean. He makes it better. It's edifying. It's wonderful. It's enriching. And you want him in your house. You know what? You could come in and you could be a roommate. I love you. When nobody is there, and this is, guys, this nobody is probably where about, I would say, 90% of the population is at today. I'm not necessarily an evil person. I'm not an unclean spirit. These are your good people. These are your people that roll through life every day, busy. That's why nobody's there. Their soul is in there. Their spirit is in there. And they're just living life. I'm working i got to go to the mall. i got to go shopping. i got to do X, Y, and Z. I give no real 
credence to what God wants. Like, I'm not trying to not honor Jesus. Like, I, I, don't, I don't not believe in Jesus. Like, I, I'll tell you I believe in Jesus. I'll tell you, you know, yeah, I, I, I'll go to church with you. Sure. These are good, honest, hard-working folks, right? This is the scary population because these are the people that are duped into thinking they have a welcomed visitor. These are the people that they don't know that they're not saved because they're good folks. But the house is empty. Then you have the third group. And this is the group that you know. And every one of you knows one of these people. They're not good people. They're not nice people. Not only do they not seek to glorify God, they can't even just live a normal, happy, productive life. These people who have given way to unclean spirits in their life, these people who have been literally taken over in their lives, these people are awful people. When you hear about somebody who kills an old lady for $10, that's not a middle-of-the-road person. That is an unclean spirit. That is some sort of something in there causing that person. When you hear about somebody walking into a church with a weapon and shooting up people who are just trying to serve the Lord because they are the wrong color, because they sang the wrong song, because somebody looked at me funny. These are those people with unclean spirits. When you know people who go out of their way to enjoy, who relish in sinfulness. You got these people on Facebook, right? You know them. The people that if you found out, you know, that they were like killing puppies, you'd be like, yeah, I can see it. Like not good people, right? There's a difference here. Jesus says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person. Now, let's stop right here. What would cause an unclean spirit to come out of a person? Why would it leave? There's only one possible reason a spirit would leave a person that it was inhabiting. Because you see, these spirits... We got we to gotta talk about this for just a second. Revelation teaches us that when, the angel, when Satan was cast down, he took a third of the angels with him. A third of the stars fell. These angels came to earth, and now they exist in this realm, in this principalities of the air, and Satan ruling over them. Um, and they have done egregious things that normal angels would not dare do. They step over lines that normal angels would not step over. Basically, any restraint that God had put on them, any authority that they felt like God had on them, they have now tried to shrug off. And they are now doing, I'm going to put in quotations, as they please, because we know through His sovereignty that God allows all things to happen. So they're not really, it's like a mouse in a cage. They really have no freedom, but they think that they do. But when you realize this, that there are demonic forces, and I don't mean to sound super Pentecostal on you guys, but we don't talk about this enough in the Baptist church. Angels are real, amen? Amen. 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 Jesus is real, amen? amen? Satan is real, amen? amen? Demons are real. And they're coming for you. They're coming. They are actively searching out someone who is ready to give their life over to them. Just like the Holy Spirit. Everything the Holy Spirit is, these unclean spirits are the copycats. I said this in the Revelation study uh, last week. Everything that Christ is, Satan desperately, desperately wants to be. You see it all through the book of Revelation. How Christ set up a kingdom. Satan sets up a kingdom. Christ is going to die and come back to life. He's done that for us. Satan... In the book of Revelation, one of the heads is wounded, a mortal wound, it dies, and it comes back to life. There is this copycat mentality. If you can do it, I can do it. If they'll honor you, they'll honor me. Everything you can do, I can do better. 
I can do anything better than you. And there's this constant attack against who Christ is by Satan. Same thing with these fallen angels. That the Holy Spirit comes and works in us as believers. And we have to come to a point where we will submit ourselves, where we, where we just buckle under the, the, the desire, the pursuit of God over our lives. And we go, okay, Lord, I've run and I've run and I've run and I can't run anymore I feel you, I feel this pushing on me, I feel this, this need and this desire, and I give my life to you, and I love you, and I want to accept you, and I repent of everything, and the Holy Spirit fills us, and now we are on charted waters, and we are on a course to live to glorify God. Same difference that there are people in this life that are so empty and so broken and so pained and so desperate that they give themselves over to dark demonic forces. I never got a good shake in life. I never had a good feel in life. I always had this against me. Things have never gone my way. And blah, 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 blah. And we just slip further and further down the hill until finally we're just all off in the mud. And we've just accepted it. And these unclean spirits eat it up. They come in and they go, you know, we can help you with that. We can make you feel much better. You know what would make you feel better? Doing this. Doing this. Saying this. To make you feel great. All those people that have made fun of you all those years, all those people that have done all of these things to you, all of these, all these people that just don't understand who you are. And man, when you give over to that, just as the Holy Spirit changes us, and you guys, if you're a believer, you know that feeling when you're like, I feel like a weight, man. I feel like a weight got taken off. Now, ministry's hard. But I feel like the weight of my salvation, it just dumped off of me and I'm ready to go. That antithesis, that opposite feeling is now put on these people where it's just a darkness that hits them. It is a constant weight that they carry with them as these unclean spirits begin to do their work. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it finds None. So why would an unclean spirit leave a person? Two reasons. Two reasons, I believe. A, they're attempting to better themselves. They're attempting to better themselves. Or B, the spirit, the unclean spirit, thinks that it can find another host to tackle. Right? I've done all I can with this one. He's wrecked and he's ruined and I'm leaving. He's done. But a lot of times I think it's A. I think it's the people that they sit down and they're like, I need to get better. I need to do this. Now they're still not submitting to Jesus, but they are, they are bent on, I'm going to fix this. I'll tell you why I think that. Because look at what it says. Then it says, I will return to my house. Look at that arrogance of that spirit there. This is now my home I will, I will come back to the host. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. That's why when you go into any Barnes & Noble, there's a huge self-help section. And there's all kinds of stuff over in that section. You go in there, and it's like, man, how to live your best life. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, uh, that's in Christianity section. Uh, sorry. Got to give my shots. There's a whole self-help section for people that just, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to get better. I'm going to make myself better. No, you're not. You're not. That pull yourself up by the bootstraps thing? No. Nah. Certain situations, sure. Certain situations, yes. I have no money. Well, you also have no job. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Go get a job and go get you some money. But when we're talking about somebody who is infested as a proper word. And they're trying to, I got to get, get rid of these things. I got to push these things out of my life. I got to get rid of it. I got to get rid of it. I got to get rid of it. And the demon backs up and goes, cool. That's fine. And it searches around and it comes back. And what does it say? And the house is swept and it's put in order and it's nice and it's neat. And the person goes, ah, I'm glad I'm not dealing with that anymore. And what does Jesus say? About the time you take that breath and you get that relief, what happens? 
it brings with itself seven others that are worse than it. And it comes in and it just throws an awesome party. And now you are slammed. You went from like, I'm kind of struggling with this and I'm kind of wanting, you know, I'm feeling these weird urges and these weird desires to now like I'm just full bore off into it. Because I tried to fix it. Because I tried to do it. You remember what I asked you to remember about the end of this? So it will be with this evil generation. It's exactly what Jesus is pointing at the Pharisees and he's going, you don't seem to understand all the rules that you have created. None of them are about real submission to Christ. None of them are about real honoring, glorifying submission to God. None of them. They're all to make you feel better. They're to make you look better. They're to make you act better. They're to clean the inside of the house. And he says, you know the problem with that? If you haven't really given your heart over to God, it's going to get nasty things are going to get even worse. And he was right. Hello. <laughs> I'm hearing myself. That was the coolest, like, out-of-body experience ever. <laughs> At least you're watching a good preacher. A few things. Let's talk about this. Number one, unclean spirits will acknowledge Christ but they will not seek to bring Him glory. Unclean spirits will acknowledge Jesus Christ. you remember the, the part in the Bible where Jesus is speaking and there's, well, Matthew 12, 25. Uh, if we go back and we just look at that quickly. Knowing their thoughts, He said to them, Every kingdom divided of itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided of itself will stand. Jesus looks and He says, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Satan, if this is happening by the power of Satan, that doesn't make any sense because if I'm driving them out by the power of Satan, I'm dividing the house and the house is going to fall. It has to be through my power. There's multiple, multiple, multiple times through the Word that these demons acknowledge who Christ is. When He comes to the, to the herd of pigs and He pulls the demons out of the men and they say, Lord Jesus, we know, please don't torment us. Like, let us go over here. They, they know exactly who Jesus is. They know the power that He possesses. The Bible says, you believe in Christ, good. Even demons believe and they shudder. So there are people who are going to try to play that card and say, well, I'm saved because I know Jesus. Knowing about Jesus doesn't make you saved. I'm going to give you a lot of information. This is almost a college lecture. If you don't submit your heart to Jesus Christ, if you don't bend your will, and if you don't give yourself in repentance to the Holy Spirit of the living God, you're going to go to hell. I don't care who you know. I don't care who you have head knowledge of. Get to heaven. Hey, I know you. Jesus goes, I know you too. I formed every hair on your head. I knit you together in your mother's womb. Awesome, so I get to go to heaven. No. I know you, but I don't know you. That's heartbreaking. Unclean spirits will acknowledge Christ, but will not seek to bring Him any glory. The Scripture is clear. When Jesus cast the unclean spirits, that they knew Christ, His ability to torment them. There may be people that we know who say they know Christ. But their lives bring Him no glory. None. Number two. There are degrees and classifications to unclean spirits just as there are for God's angelic forces. Revelation 16, 13. When we talk about Holy angels. There are degrees of angels. There are angels that are set apart for certain tasks. I didn't really realize this until I started doing the Revelation study. I knew Gabriel, I knew Michael, and I just figured God like snapped his fingers and whatever angel was available, I like, ran over there and they were like, yeah, Lord. And he's like, go down there and see what they need. Okay. But when we understand Gabriel, Gabriel's got a good gig, man. He is the messenger of good news, basically. Gabriel got to be there when Christ was born. Gabriel gets to be there when Christ returns. Gabriel is like, if for you Harry Potter fans, I know we shouldn't watch Harry Potter. But he is, he is the Hagrid in Harry Potter. Like He gets to show up for all the good stuff. Michael 
If you're a more aggressive person, Michael is the angel of what? War. He's the one, when he needed Sodom destroyed, he's like, hey, I need you to go take care of this for me. Michael is the angel that comes down and just takes care of things. But there are all of these other angels in Revelation. There are these four angels that are literally holding back the wind from the earth. There are angels that have been set in place before the beginning of time to do certain tasks. You know, there are angels that their complete job, their entire position in heaven is to hold a bowl. Just hold a bowl. And when God is ready to destroy this earth, He calls these seven angels and He fills these bowls with His wrath and they throw them down on the earth. You know, there are angels that are dispatched to minister over each one of you. And I hate to break it to you. I don't know if anybody's ever lied to you at a funeral. When you die, you do not become an angel. I hate to break it to you. All your lost loved ones, they're not up there. They're not angels. Angels are created beings. The Bible says they long to have what we have. Because, see, they were created and they were put in place, but they've never known the majesty of the Holy Spirit. They've never known that personal, loving connection of the Holy Spirit. They long for that. Like we were created and we're doing what we're created to do, but you... You were created and you walked away and He loved you so much, He came after you. He didn't do that for the fallen angels, but He did it for you. And you understand that. You understand A, angelic forces, and B, you understand why these unclean spirits are so, pardon the expression, hell-bent on making your life miserable. They didn't get what you got. They don't have what you have. And the Bible says in Revelation, there's no chance for them to attain it. And so there are these classifications of unclean spirits. There are some people that you'll meet that they are just simply just snotty, rotten people. I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. I don't believe in that man. You're like, there's a demon in there. And then there are levels to it, right? You ever open up a story on the news and you start reading and you go, how can this world get any worse? And then there's a story that comes out that makes you go, oh, like that, like that. Like people literally, there are people through the direction of these spirits like coming up with new intense ways to harm other people, intense ways to bring about the destruction of the holiness of God. It's not going to happen, but they're after it. This one's super important, and I want you to understand this. This is going to be a shot at all my Pentecostal friends. I served in an assembly's church. I've done worship there. I've heard it. I was a pastor in an assembly's church. The one thing I got so tired of, so tired of, you know, they just had the spirit of anxiety on them, and we rebuked that spirit, and it just left. (laughs) No. Paul says, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28, Paul himself admits to being anxious. He tells us in Philippians to cast our anxieties, our anxiousness to the Lord, be anxious for nothing. Why would he tell the church that in Philippians? Why would he write this letter to the church telling them not to be anxious unless there was an opportunity for them to be anxious? Why wouldn't he say, hey, I heard some of you are having anxiety issues. you got a demon. Guys, listen to me. Your anxiety issues, your depression issues, your heart rate issues, all of those things, you are not demon-possessed. And don't let the Pentecostal people tell you you are. Because they will, boy. And then they'll tell you they can drive it out. There's only one thing that will drive out an unclean spirit from a man. Sorry to tell you this. It ain't you. It is submission to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit and Him alone that these things happen. The reason 
the reason the disciples were given the ability to lay hands on people and cast out demons was because they had never seen it before. They were coming in and they were authorizing. They were bringing about the authority of the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm giving you the ability to cast out demons. I'm, take that phrase, I'm giving you, you 12, I'm giving you, this group, the ability to go and cast out demons. Why? So that way when they showed up to a town and they cast out a demon and they said, wow, what authority do you do this by? They said, Jesus Christ. They were building the church and the reputation of Christ in this moment. Now, for some reason, we demand a sign. We go back to Jonah. Now we demand a sign. Well, I'm not going to believe in Jesus unless you can cast out demons, unless you can do such and such, unless you can grab people up out of wheelchairs. I'm not, I'm not saying God can't do those things. God can work amazing miracles. I'm leery of the man who has wheelchair after wheelchair after wheelchair and then ask you to give him $10,000. Super nervous about that. The sign that we seek after, the sign that we work off of is no longer the casting out of demons. It is the sign of Jonah. Jesus going in, Jesus coming out, Jesus ascending to the Father. That is our miracle. And now when we believe on that miracle, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives us power. And yes, God can cast out unclean spirits. God can save anybody God wants to save. But I need you to understand that some of you are dealing with things and some church, some pastor, some somebody has tried to make you feel bad because if you had just a little more faith, you wouldn't be struggling with this. That's, that's junk. I'm going to get riled up in a minute. I hated it, man. I'm telling you, I did worship. I stood there and I watched people come down for prayer and they prayed and they were like, we bind this up and we rebuke it and it's gone in Jesus' name. And then next week, that person suffered a severe anxiety attack in the middle of church. And I went, okay, either A, God don't love you, B, your faith ain't strong enough, or C, you got a really bad demon. Or number four, you're just a normal person who is struggling with life. And Paul looks at you and says, cast your anxieties on the Lord. And he reminds you of that over and over and over and over because he realizes you're going to be anxious over and over and over. Guys, this, this is not, it's not rocket science, but it's also not spiritual hooey. We are a laughing stock. I'm a, I'm a bad mouth of guy. The, the Bible tells me not to. It tells me not to talk about God's anointed, but I, I don't, I'll talk about this guy. Because I think he's a phony anyway. I'm going to lose some friends over this one. Guys, Kenneth Copeland. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, stood on a stage with all of his pastors and he blew away COVID-19. Blew it away. If you haven't seen the clip, it's phenomenal. I'll post the remix because it's, it's fire when they put the beat behind it. It's awesome. He blew it away. This, this virus, God spoke to me and said that this virus doesn't like heat. And so we're going to blow a heat wave on it. He literally stood in a pulpit and went, and blew to blow away COVID-19. Guess what happened directly after that? Cases went through the roof. So then... He has to stand here with all of his pastoral team and they have to go, so now, Brother Copeland, when you did this, you know, why didn't it work? It seems like, you know, and he's like, well, you know, sometimes, stop. You know why it didn't work? You know why? False prophecy, not false positives. I know a guy dying in the ICU right now. He got something. You know why it didn't work? Same reason you still have cancer. Same reason you still have the flu. Same reason children get leukemia. Not because God is awful. 
Listen to me. Because you ain't made to be here. This body is temporary and ain't promised tomorrow. And see, when your soul gives in to these funky spirits, and I'm just going to say it, a lot of these pastors, there is a spirit they've given into, and it's greed. And I'm going to tell people what I think they want to hear, and I'm going to do things crazy. Look, by the Bible's account, we should drag Kenneth Copeland out and stone him to death because he's a false prophet. He prophesied over something. He blew it away. The next day, cases go through the roof, and they've continued to climb. That dude should get stoned to death. Instead, we send him money. What are we doing, church? What, like, just for a second. I'm going to get on a tantrum, but I, I don't want to get too riled up because y'all, y'all ready to go eat lunch. But, guys, I know you are. I know you are. Y'all ain't ready for truth. Y'all are ready for tacos. I, I get it. You are in a spiritual war. And you know what we do with it? We turn it into funky rap beats and we laugh about it. As the false prophets in the church have begun to take over the world. God, this, this, this is scary, guys. Listen for just a second. And I don't mean to rattle and I don't mean to just drone on and on. You have got people, pastors, quotations, in very influential and powerful places, and they were not put there by the Spirit of God. You go, well, why would God bless them if they were false pastors? God hasn't blessed them. Satan has given them this media because while there are truthful pastors in small country churches around the globe sharing the true gospel of Jesus Christ, people aren't hearing that. They're hearing this mess and these unclean spirits are just having a field day with it do you understand that you have millions of people around the globe today showing up to churches to try to get rid of this and they're not trying to get rid of it through submission to the holy spirit they're not trying to get rid of it by by repentance by any of those things, by the word, they're trying to get rid of it as they go sing songs and hold hands and like, I don't, I don't know, sing kumbaya and oh, I feel so much better. And then they go to work Monday and their lives are trash again. Because there's been no change. Because I showed up in the spirit of me and I went to church under the power of me and I got edified, I got excited and I got built up and I got emotional and it was great for me and then I left and I realized on Monday I really don't like me so I just continued through the week and I can't wait for Sunday again so that I can go back and redo the whole thing. Guys, and there are pastors making millions of dollars off of this. Like this is the number one that makes me so nervous. And I hate to get all riled up about it, man, but number four is awesome. You ready? I don't give a hoot about how you feel about yourself. Because there's days I feel pretty cruddy about myself. There's days I feel pretty awesome about myself. The underlying truth has to be this. Not that on bad days I'm not saved enough. Not that on bad days I got some unclean spirit and I need it exercised out. And on good days I'm feeling close to the Holy Spirit. Whatever. Jesus is stronger. You know, back when he's talking back here, if you look at it, when he's talking about uh, binding up these spirits, he says, how can a man come in 
to another man's house unless he first binds up the strong man and then can take over his house. And when you read that the first time, you think, oh man, he's, he's like giving credence to these He's giving credence to these, to these unclean spirits that they're strong. But you realize what Jesus says. The spirits are strong. They are the strong man. But the only way I can come into the house is if I bind up those unclean spirits. The only way we can start really doing any work inside of the house is if we get rid of the thief that's in there plund, plund, you know, plundering the house. If a thief is in my house when I get home from church today, if I pull up and the door gets kicked in, and I get out of the car, he's going down. Is he? You open the door, you know, you go, hello, and you hear from the back room, you hear, hey. And you're like, hey, I'm just going to make myself a cup of coffee. Come on, kids. And they go in and they start watching Disney Plus and I, we're making cups of hot chocolate and we're sitting there and he's hauling our stuff out the back door. And we're like, hey, buddy, just take what you need. We're just going to go on living. This is what Jesus says. If there's a strong man inside of the house, it takes somebody stronger to bind him up. Guess what? Guess who that is? Not me. I'm not stronger. But Christ... Christ is stronger. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. I love it. Fantastic word here. I even looked it up in the Greek to make sure it was the right word. And it is. Because sometimes they get all funky with their translations. Oh, let's go to verse 14. Let's just tell the whole story. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and people marveled. But some of them says he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. You do it by the power of Satan, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against Satan, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, to whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has actually come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus makes this point and says there's a strong man getting ready to defend his house, but there's one stronger who comes along and takes him over. I love what Jesus says there, and that word is actually that word. He says, if I overcome them by the finger of God. You think about this. If I have to fight a snake, we fought a snake out at Moe's house one night. There was like eight of us. If you haven't had, heard that story, we were all having dinner and Miranda Ham comes in the house and she's, she's losing it, having a fit. Is this a snake? Is this a snake outside? Is this a snake? We all get up from the table and Jared's like, it's going to be a snake. You know, be. We're like, where is it? It's out here. It's out here underneath this pallet. Okay, whatever. And we go out there and Jared's got like this level, this big old long level. He just grabs it and walks over there. He's like, I'm just going to whack it. He goes over there and they flip that pallet over and it's like this six and a half foot. I mean, that joker curls up and we all go, whoop, nope. <laughs> and Jared's got to get this thing with this level and Mo comes up with a machete. And Mo's about to take care of business. And as he's about to take care of business, Jared lets that joker go for whatever reason. Snake comes loose, Jared comes out. We're running. We get it set down a second time. Jared gets this joker. He gets it about halfway down its back. Mo goes to hit this snake. The snake comes up and bites the machete. And so finally, we take care of business. Ten minutes later, Karen shows up with all the weaponry. <laughs> She's like, y'all need a gun? We're like, it's, it's done. If I would have tried to fight that snake with my finger, if I was like, step back, boys. I'll show y'all how it's done. All right? Take this joker down. 
If there's a pit bull outside and it's running around, and I don't say pit bulls because pit bulls are okay, fine, German shepherd. Big dog. And this big dog, I walk outside here, I'm about to go get in the car, and this dog bears down. And I'm like, all right, here we go. I got it. We jab that jugger right, right in the eye. Right? Is there any animal that I think I could actually beat up with my finger? With one finger? A bird? Okay, let's go with a bird. Uh, yeah, no, nah, nah. let's go with a bird. We'll, we'll use a bird everybody knows. Y'all ever been out here to, to J.C. Park out in Ennis with them dang ducks and geese? That goose, when we talk about possessed by the devil, that goose out there is possessed by the devil. You ain't fighting no goose with your finger. It's not happening. I don't even want to fight a little bird with my finger. A rabbit. Did you say a rabbit? A rat? No! Nah. That's worse than a snake. There are very few animals that I would try to take on with one finger. Let's think them through. An ant, maybe? One ant, not a bunch of ants, one ant. Yeah, not a whole pile of them. One ant? Uh, cricket? I could probably take cricket. Snail? Yeah. This should let you know where you fall on the evolutionary ladder. Just letting you know that when you think, there's not very many animals that I'd want to take on with one. Even when you're at SeaWorld and there's the tank full of like the stingrays, and they're like, well, just put one hand down there and just pet that thing. And you're like, mm-mm. That's that joker that got Steve Irwin. They're, mm-mm, they're shady. There's not very many things that I think, man, I can take this with one finger. The reason I make all these stupid metaphors is this. All of these unclean spirits, Jesus looks and He says, if I do this by the finger of God, and that word in the Greek literally means the finger. That when we say God is stronger, Jesus is stronger, that for those that are struggling with these unclean spirits, for those that are struggling with this severe, severe oppression, these demonic forces, for those that are struggling with light and momentary afflictions, for those that are struggling off and on with seasonal things or daily with everyday things, Jesus is stronger by the finger, not even the hand, not even the full hand of God. You're literally praying going, Lord, I just need your help. And literally from the throne, God goes, Boop. and all of the weight comes off of you and you're like, thank you. No effort. None. Jesus is stronger. The last word of peace. We know from Scripture that once we have truly repented and submitted to Christ, that the Holy Spirit indwells in us and will never leave us. There is nothing that can snatch us from the hand of God. Amen? But in His graciousness, God has allowed escape for those that are attempting to be fulfilled in their own spirit or worse, who have been taken hostage by an unclean spirit. I put here Mark chapter 9, verse 20. I want to read through this quickly, quickly, quickly. Mark chapter 9, verse 20. And someone from the crowd, verse 17, somebody from the crowd brought answer to him and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. This is severe. This was not normalized. If this were normalized, it wouldn't have been in the Bible. You think about it that way? There weren't like bajillions of kids suffering under this. 
But this was a father that brings his son, and the son is having these intense seizures brought on by the spirit. He throws him down, he foams, he grinds his teeth, he becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out, and they weren't able to. Think about how humbling that is as a disciple. Jesus has given you the ability to cast out demons, man, and you're over here praying on this kid. And this kid is just seized up and he's just, uh, and he's foaming at the mouth and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you got all the boys over there, man, and they're all laying hands on him and they're all praying and nothing. You want to talk about feeling like a failure? When you walk away from this and the dad goes, you've done this for like a thousand other people. And they're like, we, we don't know. I don't know how to do this. Oh, so evidently my son doesn't get the salvation? My son doesn't get the healing? So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, Jesus answered them, Faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And you go, Jesus got an attitude. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, and he rolled about foaming at the mouth. This is amazing to me. The boy is laying there. He's writhing, and he's foaming. The disciples are freaking out because they haven't been able to do anything about this. The boy is in the middle of an intense seizure. Jesus is standing there. He's just called everybody faithless, and he looks at the father How long has this been happening? From childhood. Oftentimes it throws him into the fire and into water to destroy him. Like we'll build a fire to cook on and it just flings him into the fire. We'll be next to the river. It throws him into the river trying to drown him like this kid. Guys, when we talk about this, this is not... This anxiety, this depression. This is like, this thing is trying to end this boy's life. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You realize why Jesus just said, you faithless generation? He wasn't aiming that at the disciples. Probably made them feel bad. You find out why he said that right here. And Jesus said to him, if you can. You realize what the father just said? I brought this boy here. I don't really believe in you, but I've heard that you've done this for other people. There's no real desire or repentance here. I just need my miracle and then I'm out. I just need the sign. I just need you to do this for me to make my life easier. I just need this done and then we're bouncing. Right? When I got on you earlier about the spirit of the American church, why I get so vexed and anxious and angry at the American church, this is exactly it. I just showed up, I need my bit, I need my piece, and then I'm going to roll out. And you look at Christ, you look at the response of Jesus Christ Almighty, and He looks at this man and goes, If you can, if I can, if I can. Other people have drugged people onto roofs saying, I know you can. Other people have brought their friends for miles saying, I know you can. Other people have come to me blind and they have walked across cities blind. They have crawled on their hands and knees and said, I know you can. And now you stand here and say, if you can, if you can. Jesus get a little riled up. All things are possible for the one who believes. It's possible. If you'll believe, it's possible. You know why Jesus took this interlude? The boy's still writhing on the ground. The disciples are still over here, you know, head down. It's still, it's still a tense scene at the bottom of this mountain. Here's why Jesus took the interlude. Look at what He says. Immediately, verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe Help my 
what? Unbelief. Not help my boy, not help this cause, not help me feel better, not fix this one little temporary thing. You help me believe. I believe in you. You help me believe. That's what I'm asking. I'm not asking you now. You've shifted. My gaze has shifted. Now if you do this, I'll know. I will know. And when Jesus saw a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, Oh, he's dead. He's dead. The boy's laying there. The crowd has time to say, He's dead. Dad is sitting there. Oh my God. You killed him. I didn't want you to kill him. I wanted you to save him. Boy's laid out. But Jesus took him by the hand. Think about it, man. Think about it. Let it get you all warm and fuzzy on the inside. That boy's dead. He's laid out. Dad's weeping, wailing. Oh, man, what did we do? What have we done? Jesus walks over. He leans down. He picks the boy up by the hand. He goes, hey, come on, get up. And the boy sits up. Jesus goes, come on, pick yourself up. The boy stands up. Mark 9, you understand this process. You understand that Jesus Christ will not be mocked. That there are so many people using these stories, using this word for profit, for fame, for fortune, for all of these things, misusing this word to make people feel awful about themselves. Jesus stood there with a daddy and walked him through repentance before he saved his boy. Walked him through it. Guys, for some of us here, the unclean spirits haven't attacked you. They've attacked people you love. And you've had to sit and you've had to watch that. Let me give you a word of advice. Jesus isn't doing that to torment that person. That's not how God works. But He may be doing it to change you. I've had to say this to quite a few people. He may be allowing things to happen to somebody else that you love to change your heart. To break you down to the point that you say, you know what, Lord? I got nothing. And I believe. Help my unbelief. True repentance, coupled with great prayer and fasting, can drive away even the most aggressive, unclean spirit. The disciples come back in. Why couldn't we do this? We don't understand. Jesus, because this one only comes about by prayer and fasting. You boys weren't ready. This was a big one. This was the Ali, and you were in there thinking you were fighting some scrub from downtown. Jesus says, you weren't ready for this fight. It's okay. It teaches you. It teaches him. It teaches everybody. But more than anything, it takes us back to Jesus is strong enough. Jesus jumped in the ring, took him down. If you're here and you've been dealing with some stuff, man, maybe you're here and you're dealing with somebody who's dealing with some stuff. I'm going to be here, and if you are feeling that tug for salvation, if you're feeling that that tug and that desire to be saved, if, if, if something inside of you is saying... We don't have a relationship with Christ. We know Jesus, but we don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray with you. But what I want to do more than that is this. These steps. Something powerful, man. Not about coming up here so everybody can talk about you. You know, this used to be Facebook. People come up and they'd lay their heart out on the altar and the rest of the church would sit there. I wonder what they're praying about. I wonder what's going on with them. Oh, if they're crying hard, it must be something big. That's not why we do it. 
but to come to the altar and weep and to cry out for those that we love, to weep and cry out over situations that we have no control over, in the hope that, in the hope that, as you lay there and weep, somebody comes along and prays with you, stands in agreement with you, weeps with you, because that's what churches do. So if you need prayer, if you want to pray, and you want to have somebody pray with you, these steps are open, this altar is open for a time of prayer. If you need a relationship with Christ, I'd love to speak with you and pray with you and introduce you to the greatest man I've ever met. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, and we know that it's been a long day. God, we know that we've been in here for a bit. But God, this is serious business. God, this isn't some 20-minute feel-good message and we go home. God, this is learning how to do battle. This is learning, Father, how, how and why the evil one operates. This is learning how we stand against it. And we stand against it, the book of James says, resist the devil and he will flee. But we can only resist, we can only stand in your power. We can only stand in the power of Jesus Christ. Because if we stand in our power, we're done. The Bible also says that he goes to and fro, back and forth across the earth, looking for someone to devour. God, if we are not suited up in your armor, we're done. And so, Father, I just pray that you would give us the strength and the ability and the endurance to stand in your power, in your word, in your belief, Father, in this in this true heart of repentance, in this true heart of salvation that says, I will not be shaken because I don't stand on my feet, but I stand on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I stand on what Christ has done for me. And Father, we just pray that you would just watch over us. Father, right now, if there's somebody in this gathering, if there's somebody on Facebook, if there's somebody within earshot of my voice, Father, that, that they know that they need you. Father, we just pray that you would just work on their heart right now. God, that you would just call them to repentance, that they know that they've been living for themselves. They know that they've been empty and they've been running. Not really trying to glorify you, not really trying to love you, but just doing what they do. Father, help us to have a death today, a funeral today for ourselves for our spirit, so that we can invite the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you that you are strong enough. That no matter what we face in life, that you are strong enough. That no matter what guilt Satan tries to bring on us, that you are strong enough to take it away. That no matter what pain he tries to inflict on us, that you are strong enough to take it away. We just have to believe. So help us, Lord, in our unbelief. Help us, Lord. Help us when we're selfish and all we want is a sign. Help us when we're... when all we want is something easy. We know you can. We know you can. And we believe it, Lord. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would stand with us while we sing. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. 
It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I want to say something to y'all. Thank you for y'all prayers and y'all being here. If it for y'all and God, he wouldn't be here because the church he went to is for y'all and God. So thank you for each one of y'all. Amen. Amen. And y'all be praying for Mike. He goes Thursday, uh, December 3rd. He's going to have back surgery. Um, we've been praying over that. Christy just, praise God. It's your first Sunday back. I didn't think about that. First Sunday back, she had double bypass. Uh, we had, uh, I can let the cat out of the bag now. They, they didn't know. We had asked a bunch of folks in the church to help provide meals, and, and they were one of the families. And uh, I saw them yesterday at H-E-B, and she was standing there, and I said, hey, you need to put half them groceries back. But uh, I was glad to see her out and up. I was like, man, she's probably still at the house. I mean, if I had double bypass, I'd, I'd be milking it, but I'm a guy, so uh, <laughs> I'd be laid up for a good couple of months. Just, oh, I can't do it. Uh, but y'all be praying for Mike, because Mike's going to go in for surgery, and you know, Christy's up, but she's still not, she's still not feeling, not feeling a hundred percent. So what's that? Yeah. So Macy's going to be the woman of the house pretty soon. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> um, Somebody else y'all y'all would if y'all would pray for is uh, Eddie Allen. I don't know if you saw it. Eddie uh, Eddie come home Wednesday from work and his knee was swollen up. He went to the emergency room and they cut him open Thursday morning, Thanksgiving morning. Had a severe infection, and so uh, evidently they got him on some pretty good pain medicine. He was sending me some messages yesterday that were pretty entertaining. So uh, he would send me a message and I would go, "What?" And then he would send me another message, and I'd go, what? And finally, he started sending me pictures, and I was like, uh, no, okay. Uh, they were entertaining, though. But uh, y'all just pray for him. Pray for Lori. She's, she's having a, a, a kind of a tough time right now with him and, and with some other things. And so just a lot going on in the Allen house. So y'all pray for the Allens. Um, he'll be coming home hopefully today or tomorrow. Okay. And so then he'll be at home for four weeks probably. I mean, they said crutches for four to six weeks and no work for six weeks. So if you know Eddie, no work for six weeks, that dude's going to go nuts. So <laughs> yeah, y'all better get him like some tinker toys or something he can put together. But, uh, but anyway, um, anybody else that we need to be praying for? Anything else? Nothing? Miss Barb, that was the other one. That was the other family. Miss Barb, if you're watching, sorry to let the cat out of that bag. I was going to call you here in a little bit, but uh, Miss Barb did find out that she has breast cancer and she's going to be going in for surgery. And so um, I was texting with her about some things and Don, her husband, is going to have a whole bunch of different things coming up this month. So they're the other family that this next week you guys are going to help provide meals to. So thank you for that. Thank you for those that said they could help with meals and delivery and all that good stuff. And um, just thank you. Thank you for... Um, and this is a shameless kind of plug, but thank you for tithing in because those tithes help. If there's a day that somebody can't pick up a meal, the church can provide that and we can take it to her. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, you're, you're blessing people. You might not even know these people, but you're a huge blessing to them. Um, all right. If you can help and stay and decorate, I'll 
take care of lunch for you, and I know they would appreciate Are y'all decorating right after church, right? Yeah. We're going to put up a whole bunch of uh, pagan Christmas trees and, and Christmas lights and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's it's going to be a good time. i got to hide my wise men for, for week number one in December. Miss Barb, if you are watching, I'll get them hit. I'll let you know where they're at. All right. Guys, love you guys. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for who you are, God. Such a heavy day, such a heavy topic. But at the same time, Lord, it's a heavy thing. When we walk out these doors, God, for some of us, while we sat here, the rulers of the principalities of the air, God, Satan and his forces, they were just attacking. We sit here, we try to hear your word, God, and, and just things, man. There's just, these spirits just draw our attention. These demonic forces, they draw our attention. They entice us to look every which way except after you, except after your glory. And so, Father, I just pray that as we leave this place, God, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to keep our hearts fixed on you. Help us, Lord, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be followers of Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you, and it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. You're hidden.